Um, all right, I'm going to get us started today. I'm going to get us started today. And the late comers will have to sneak in up the back. So, my name is Joe Ball, and I'll be your host today for the launch of the Housing for the Aged Action Group report Out of the Closet, Out of Options, Older LGBTI People at Risk of Homelessness. I'd like to start today with acknowledgement of country. If you are in Australia, you are on Aboriginal land. And today I am speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us today and to acknowledge your elders, past, present and emerging. And to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. There was never a treaty in this country. And therefore it always was and it always will be Aboriginal land. And when we talk about housing and homelessness on this day, we need to remember that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been dispossessed of their homes since invasion in 1788. And today, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are more likely to sleep rough, sleep rough live in overcrowded housing or in exploitative rent, rental conditions. Thanks to everyone for coming today. As I said, I'm Joe Ball, I'm the CEO, I'm the very proud CEO of Switchboard Victoria. At Switchboard Victoria, we run a home visiting program for older LGBTI people called Out and About. Um, and you can find out more of that information by going to our website. We also recently launched a new Navigator Connector service at Switchboard for all LGBTIQA plus people of all ages called the Rainbow Door a service that you can use for secondary consult when supporting an LGBTIQA plus person or as an individual to receive support, referral and information. And it includes seeking support around issues of ageing. So just some housekeeping points to start off. If you're looking for the toilets, you'll find them in your bathroom. If you were looking for tea and coffee, you'll have to go to your kitchen. And you might have noticed that you're on mute and that's why I can't hear you hysterically laughing at my jokes. So you are muted for the duration of, um, of this session and the event will be recorded. So we encourage you to use the chat function because um, you can't speak to us directly verbally. And I, again, I remind people the chat function is down the bottom of your screen. Um, there's a speech bubble to your right that says chat. Use that one, please. Um, and if you haven't already used the chat function to introduce yourself, please do. And later on today, there'll be a chance to ask questions of the panelists. And that's an opportunity where you'll again use the chat function. So yesterday, thank, oh look, thank you for everyone who's still laughing at my jokes. Appreciate that. I can see that in the chat function. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of reading the report. Um, I got a, you know, I, I saw it a bit earlier. Um, I got to read the report that we're launching, which is out of the closet out of options, older LGBTI people at risk of homelessness. And if there's two things you take out of today, from my perspective, they would be the recommendations of the report, which is that we need more affordable housing options for older LGBTI people, and we need more culturally appropriate community education about housing options to prevent older LGBTI people becoming homeless. I want to acknowledge Housing for the Aged Action Group for producing this report, and for their ongoing activism and advocacy around housing equity for LGBTI older people. I also want to acknowledge that this work and this, and this report was done in partnership through a steering committee that Switchboard Victoria is involved in. And the other steering committee members are VALS LGBTI Aging and Aged Care, the Australian Associ Association of Gerontology LGBTI Working Group, Transgender Victoria and Thorn Harbour Health. At the end of today's session, I will be going through some of the services that the steering committee members provide and I really encourage you to stick to the very end so you can hear about the services that are available and, and I will go through them. For all of you I know who are very keen to read this report, I'm sure you can imagine that it's not an easy read. This report is as much a reflection of what is happening right now as it is a prediction of the future. That without action, we will see LGBTI, LGBTI older people not only living in unchanged poor circumstances, but that it will get worse. It is at this point that I want to acknowledge all those LGBTI elders 
who have gone before us and who are joining us today. I want to acknowledge the trailblazers, the activists, and those who have forged a brighter future already for today's generation. We acknowledge you and we show our respect by fighting for a better now for LGBTI older people. To officially launch the Housing for the Aged Action Group report out of the closet, out of options, older LGBTI people at risk of homelessness, I welcome Commissioner Roe Allen to the screen. Roe Allen is an experienced and long-standing advocate for LGBTIQ Victorians and has held leadership positions in the community and government sectors. Roe has been a member of three Victorian government LGBTI ministerial advisory groups and chaired the Ministerial Advisory Committee on LGBTI Health and Wellbeing between 2007 and 2009. Victoria became the first state in Australia to have a commissioner for gender and sexuality when Roe Allen was appointed to the role in 2015, making Roe the first commissioner for gender and sexuality. After decades of championing the interests of these populations, in 2020, the title was changed to Commissioner for LGBTIQ plus communities to better reflect the diversity of rainbow communities. Thanks Commissioner for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Joe, and thanks everyone for having me. It's a great pleasure to be invited to launch this report. I'm uh, coming from the land of the Yorta Yorta and I wanna pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present, always was and always will be Aboriginal land and uh, never ceded, as you said, no treaty was formed. I'm proud to be part of a Victorian government that is working on treaty with Aboriginal people. But to give a recognition is not only respectful, I think it's basic manners. And I think um, we do that to show our respect and manners. So I want to do that this morning. Uh, and also uh, to the trailblazers, to the older LGBTIQ folks that um, have took me under their wing when I was a baby dyke. Um, and looked after me. And I think we've got a lot to do and a lot of work. And this report does highlight a lot of things that shows the inequalities for LGBTIQ older members of our community. I also want to acknowledge that this, this report was probably written, um, or was written and, and the evidence gathered before COVID and COVID has only magnified the inequalities for our whole community, but particularly the most marginalized, which is the older population. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the report because that'll steal all of Fiona's thunder because it's the next presentation. And if I went through all the recommendations, um, you'd hear it twice. But I have to agree with Joe, it's a very sombre read. And it, but what it does do is it gives us the evidence base behind what we've known for a long time. Uh, and just like there's no one way to be LGBTIQ, there's no one way to be homeless. Uh, and many of our community don't even understand that they are in you know, high risk category of homeless because they, they have a self belief or a self worth um, that this is all they deserve. Uh, for many gay men, they never thought they would have the luxury I suppose of getting old and they live with the survivor guilt amongst that and they've sold their properties. Uh, they went traveling and you know, they've, they've now got themselves in a, a very predictable, um, predictable financial situation. Uh, for women who have had lower wages their whole life and insecure work, um, it's not surprising that they've ended up the place they have. But I think the underlying thing that um, we're now getting more evidence and this report helps us to understand is that we've always been a high population of um, people that have been discriminated against and it, with that discrimination comes anxiety, depression, and there are a lot of barriers to stable employment. Uh, as, as we get older, um, there's other work. Dr. Catherine Barrett's work shows us that um, LGBTI uh, older folks are more, more likely to be isolated um, from family and friends. And potentially that isolation gives them more opportunity to be um, victims of elder abuse. And, and that can be another, um, another driver of, of homelessness. Um, we, What's great about this report is it's not, um, it's not us doing it ourselves. Uh, you know, and as much as I love Dr. Catherine Barrett and as much as I love Ruth McNair and Dr. Cal Andrews who've done um, LGBTI homeless report, uh, they all are members of our community. Credible research, absolutely. But one of the things that I love about this is the collaboration um, with the Housing for Aged Care, Aged Action Group, as, as Joe said, with Val Switchboard, TGV, Thorn Harbour Health, um, and the Australian Association of Genitology, you know, that, 
that collaboration is not just our own community pushing our own barrow and it's and it's mainstream uh advocacy organizations around housing coming together with us which strengthens the, our own work one of the other things that's recently happened in victoria is the victorian population health data and that backs up um, what the findings out of out of the closet out of options as well and so the more pieces of work that start to join the dots um, hopefully um, everybody in the sector and i can see from the chat how diverse you are in relation to the, the participants today and many of you are in the housing sector and all across victoria i see Wimmera, and gippsland you're all there which is great uh, and and so what it does is it gives us a bigger, broader picture. Uh, and, and that evidence is what we, in the research gives us the evidence and the evidence obviously gives us the funding. So some of the things, just very quickly, some of the things in the Victorian population health data, which also supports this work, shows that as, a, as an adult community, um, we are more likely to be renters. Uh, we, um, we are though in contact with one or four one to four uh, community members or people within the last 24 hours. So that showed, and we're more likely to be part of community groups. So that also is picked up in your report, how, how incredibly important it is for people to stay connected to where they live and the people that they um, connect with around, around community. So um, that's really important. But we also are higher in the number of households that have a, up to a maximum of a 40,000 uh, total household income. Uh, and we're higher in population than the heterosexual cisgender community in not being able to raise $2,000 in an emergency in, in, a lot, in two days. And they're kind of benchmarks that the population health data uh, give us. So we know we're developing that picture, of, of course, of being um, at an older age at risk of homelessness. Um, also from the, the Victorian population health data, 34% of older LGBTIQ people experience discrimination or were treated unfairly in the last 12 months. So that also gives us an idea that they're probably treated unfairly in the housing market. So as you can see, all of these, all of these things build to, to what we're now understanding is obviously a higher population of older people within the LGBTIQ uh, folks. Whether it's um, perceived or real discrimination that they experience in housing services. Many of the housing services are faith-based organisations. And of course, for many of an older uh, queer community going to seeking help from a church, that they've, they've had a historic, real or perceived understanding that that would they would experience another level of discrimination in doing that. So they may not have got that you know that help earlier on in their journey, or they, and, and it's clear that they don't understand what the service pathways are. Except it's interesting in your report, lesbians did understand that. Maybe it's because the stereotype they've worked in the community service sector. Uh, I don't know, there's another stereotype that could be another research paper, how many lesbians work for community services. But it's really clear that we have to do more. So one of the things that we did do, the Victorian government did do in the last election is made an election commitment for $3 million for LGBTI homelessness. Now, it was about to be tendered out just before COVID. It's in DHHS. And I would usually say, you know, this is awful. You know, homelessness is happening now. We need to put it out. But reports like, here we go, out of the closet, out of options, and the fact that this has come out during the COVID period means that uh, we can actually incorporate the recommendations, the findings, and the weightings around older LGBTIQ folk in the distribution of the $3 million. Uh, I asked someone to tell me when would that be out. Um, we usually say the words, it's imminent in government. That's how we go when it's coming out. But to be honest, those guidelines for the $3 million will come out at the end of the year or um, early next year. So I want to commend um, this piece of work to everybody. It's, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard read because you are hearing what we already fundamentally know uh, as evidence that LGBTI older community members have suffered a lot, a lot of things during their life and at the end of their life, they're now experiencing um, homelessness at a greater level. So can I thank everyone that's been part of this collaboration. Congratulations to all the researchers, to all the people that were out in that hot day uh, at midsummer doing the surveys and on the phone. It's not hard, it's not easy, it's hard work, uh, it's important work, it's noble work, and I officially want to launch out of the closet, out of options. Thank you everybody, and I'll hand back to Joe. Thanks, Ro, and I 
um, I'm sure their people are applauding in front of their computer, the official moment of launching the report. Um, uh, and it's thanks for being with us today, Ro, and doing that um, and doing the official launch. The next two speakers joining us will be speaking to the findings in the report. And first up um, is Fiona York. Fiona York is the Executive Officer of Housing for the Aged Action Group, HAG. Fiona has 15 years experience in the community sector, working mainly in ageing, elder abuse and diversity. HAG is the convener of the LGBTI Elders Housing Reference Group and, the, and in the process of earning a Rainbow Tick accreditation. Welcome to the screen, Fiona. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be here. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm also on Wurundjeri land and that sovereignty was never ceded and it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I'd also like to thank the Commissioner for those words. They were really fantastic. And thanks to our steering committee members um, that Joe mentioned, some of them are attending today and it's really great to see them all here. It couldn't have been done without um, that valuable work. Also a big thanks to Rebecca, um, the project worker on this, who has pulled most of this together on very, very part-time hours with um, hardly any funding. So <laughs> thanks Rebecca for all your work. And a little shout out to Street Smart, who was pretty much the only person that wanted to throw any money at this project. So um, yeah, thank you. So we're really excited to be here today. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're a small community organisation. We started in 1983 from a, by a group of older women who were public housing advocates. Um, so over the years we've grown, we now have about um, 480 members and we deliver the Home at Last service, which is a specialist older person's housing service and it provides information and support to people who are aged 50 years and older. And so we have an early intervention approach. Um, we try to reach people before they um, are at crisis point, and then we can prevent that crisis from happening. So we're an organisation that specialises in housing for older people, and we have really detailed specialist knowledge about that, but we're a mainstream service, as Ro mentioned. So we are going through rainbow tick at the moment, but we're by no means experts on the issues for older LGBTI people. So we thought it was really important for us to partner with services and organisations who are embedded in the LGBTI community, particularly those that work with older people. So we can find out exactly what's going on for them in terms of their housing circumstances and their knowledge of housing options. Um, so about two years ago, we formed this steering committee and we knew that there was a real lack of research into this area, which Tonya will be talking about shortly. Um, and we think that this research that was just launched today is a world first in terms of looking at these issues. So between 2019 and 2020, we surveyed and interviewed 228 older LGBTI people about their housing circumstances. Um, whether they rent or own, can they afford the rent? Are they in housing stress? Do they know where to go for help? And have they thought about their housing options as they get older? So they came from a variety of housing backgrounds, um, including public and social housing tenants, couch servers, homeowners, renters, and they were interviewed face to face over the phone and they completed surveys at Midsummer and online. So I'm now going to tell you a little bit about what we found out and you can read more about this in the reports online. So the first significant finding that we found was that our research showed that LGBTI older people have experienced homelessness and housing stress at higher rates than the general population. So 40% of participants said that they had experienced homelessness and 16% said that they were currently at risk. And these replicate the findings of a survey that was under, undertaken by the Victorian Gay and Lesbian Rights Lobby. But we actually think that these figures are just the tip of the iceberg because there were even higher numbers of older LGBTI people that were living in circumstances that actually placed them at risk um, of homelessness or of housing stress. So some of those risk factors include much lower rates of home ownership. So less than half of our participants indicated they own their own home. And of this group, only 27% owned their home outright. So when you compare that with the general population, age 55 and older, we have 85% owning their own home with 65% owning it outright. So you can see there's a real disparity there. 
The other risk factor, as Roy mentioned, is living in private rental. So the sad reality is that lots of older tenants who are living in private rental at the moment are at risk of homelessness because of the high rents and the constant threat of eviction and the inability to make modifications to their homes to allow them to age in place. So of the people that we surveyed, over a third were living in private rental and of this group, 36% were on a government pension and a third were unable to afford the rent currently. So with so much of their income being spent on housing costs, older LGBTI people that live on the pension were in significant poverty with not much money left over after they pay the rent. The other risk factor is living alone. And the reason that um, that places you at risk, if, especially if you're in private rental, is just because it's really hard to pay the rent on one income. So the number of people living alone in our sample was significantly higher than the general population. We had 47% of people aged 55 to 64 in our survey compared to only 6.2% of the general population. So that's seven times higher, which is significant. The other thing that we noticed in the research was that there was a bit of a trend about living in sort of what we would say, I guess, unconventional housing circumstances. So resorting to kind of, undes well, I guess not necessarily, but potentially undesirable um, measures to avoid a housing crisis. So for example, people told us about staying in unhappy relationships to have financial security. Um, stay, subletting rooms, staying with friends temporarily or living in um, inappropriate, unsuitable accommodation because they had no other options. And these measures may work for a little while, but unless people are clear about the expectations going forward as you age, it may, relationships may break down and then you can find yourself in real trouble. So that was another trend that we noticed. The last significant trend as a risk factor that we found was that there were really high numbers of older people living with disabilities and in caring roles. So for those people that were on the disability support pension, 40% identified as currently at risk of homelessness and 80% had previously been at risk of homelessness. For those in caring roles, 23% said that they were currently at risk of homelessness. So I guess the most alarming finding for us in this research was that people don't know that they're at risk um, and they don't know where to go for help if they are finding themselves in trouble. So they're two pieces of really important information. An example of this um, is Leanne. So she's a 65 year old lesbian who currently lives a alone in private rental that she can't afford. She's not in paid employment. She has no superannuation and she relies solely on the disability support pension for income. Despite having several risk factors for being homeless, she doesn't identi identify herself as at risk. And the most alarming thing is that she had no awareness of support services if she was to become homeless. And she's not alone because 63% of the people that we spoke to had limited or no knowledge at all of housing options for older people. And 60% didn't know where to go to find that out. The other story um, that we heard was an example here of um, Pat, who's a 50 year old bisexual. And at the time that we surveyed, um, they were homeless and couch surfing at friends between living in their van. So Pat is not engaged in paid work um, and relies solely on the government pension for income. But despite experiencing homelessness currently, they stated they had no knowledge of services that could help them. And that was the same for 65% of people who self-identified as currently being at risk. They didn't know where to go. So what can we do about it? Um, we think we need urgent sector and policy responses around LGBTI people and housing, particularly older people um, who are to reduce the risk. So we need urgent policy reform. Um, the first thing that we're calling for is that we need more housing options. We need more appropriate housing options for older LGBTI people. There's a housing shortage and we need more housing. The second thing is we need to provide better homelessness and housing support services for older LGBTI people. Um, and that involves providing training to the existing housing and homelessness sector so that they do know how to respond if people are fronting up at their services. The other thing we need is to improve our data collection methods. Um, currently, we're not collecting the data and it's really difficult to be able to track the problem unless that data collection is routinely done throughout the whole sector. And the last thing we're calling for is funding for further research, um, especially for underrepresented groups. 
So we've prepared a policy snapshot, which is on our website. The link's been shared in the chat. Um, and our full report goes into a lot more de detail about these issues and I'd encourage you all to have a read. Um, now, if I may, I may, I'm gonna quickly play a video from one of our partners, um, Pauline Primary from Vows Aging and Aged Care, who talks about why we need to have um, these services in place. So hopefully this is gonna work. Let's, you know, technology, let's see how we go, hey? Okay, can you guys all see that? Yep, great. Um, and Hear it? Their need for secure um, housing in order to um, be able to age um, safely. I think one of the um, areas that we often um, recognise is that people don't plan as they age, and I think this housing project is a really important. Oopsie. To ensure that older LGBTI people uh, will do become aware of their housing options and the need for secure and safe housing as they age. We're really excited to be part of this project and um, we recognise that there needs to be a lot more information um, for all services who are working with older LGBTI people, but um, importantly for older LGBTI people themselves so that they have a range of information um, that can support them as they age. Great. That's it from me, Joe. I'll hand back over to you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, Fiona. And, um, you know, one of the reasons at Switchboard Victoria that we set up the Rainbow Door was recognising the need for a navigator connector service in order to help people access services through, the, you know, these stories that we saw in our Out and About program and our work um, supporting older LGBTI people is we, we, we came across the same experiences in our service provision. Um, and that is one of the focuses of Rainbow Door is to provide information and referral and support to older people. However, the piece of the public puzzle there is um, we need to, you know, we need to build the referral pathways that in order that we can refer people on. So um, I encourage people to use the Rainbow Door as a connected navigator mold, model, but also I really encourage you to take up um, the policy position that, uh, that, that HAG has put forward today um, and become active around this issue.